Welcome to our cross-border conversation about the role of the assistant editor. My name is Elizabeth McIntyre. I'm from Screencraft Works. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white woman with light brown hair and glasses. A really big thank you to our partner, Genelec, for supporting this series. Thank you also to our mentoring scheme partners, Brunel University London, Screencraft Works is a not-for-profit community of cross-border mentoring, cross-border talks, and cross-border networking for all those in production and post-production. Our speakers are drawn from our mentoring community, and we're thrilled to have such inspiring and impressive speakers here with us today. Thank you, Elizabeth. My name is Helena Beeson. I have been working in post-production in the UK for about eight years now, um, starting out as a second assistant editor, developing into a first assistant, and now I'm currently working as a VFX editor, a role that I didn't see myself in, but it's a uh, it's an avenue that we'll discuss this evening. I've worked on a range of stuff from um, low budget feature films uh, all the way up to Sky Netflix programs um so I've got a reasonable range of experience within uh, different workflows one film that I worked on that I'm incredibly proud of is God's Own Country which was released in 2017 and uh, I'd like to show you a little clip of that now come on that's it so they call thee Georgie or something? Georgie. Whatever, get in. I love need help. I could have managed, I've done so far. Yeah, of course you have. We're not running a charity for Waves and Strays, like. It's perfect for me. As I say, that was a film that I'm incredibly proud of having worked on. It was, I think, only my second job, um, and I was incredibly lucky to have been brought onto that film. I'd like to pass over to Scott now for an introduction. Thanks, Helena. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Scott, and um, I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I uh, started off uh, out of film school as a corporate video editor uh, in Canada. Um, I then uh, sort of wound up in features, first as a behind the scenes uh, videographer. Uh, and then I transitioned over to the VFX department uh, as an assistant. And while I was there, I saw the editorial department, uh, fell in love with it, wanted to be in it. I eventually moved to London and um, about uh, nine years ago, uh, des decided to get into uh, assistant editing and uh, I started uh, from the ground up and uh, I've just been working away, for, as I say, for the past nine years. Worked on a range of stuff, everything from micro budget uh, features up to uh, studio films. And actually one of the, the first sort of films where I was really trained as an assistant was on a major studio film that I was lucky enough to get on. Merry Christmas, Clara. Godfather. Your gift this year will be something you'll never forget. Most people don't realize there are troubled realms within our world. And you hold the key. And uh, I'll just pass on to Alice now. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Alice. Originally, I'm from Italy. Um, and then I moved here in London to study film production. I recently graduated from Brunel University and now I'm working as a freelancer, um, freelance video editor and camera trainee. Just got my first credit in the camera department and now I'm looking forward to get one in the editorial department as well. I'm working mainly as a video editor, editing, uh, edited for a few uh, companies, mainly like interviews and short videos, also a bit of podcasts. 
And um, I've been working with my mentor, Trace Taylor, on this, well, editing exercise mainly. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I just did a little teaser um, about this, this short film. I know you're a big secret, Ralph. Really? There goes our last speaker of tonight, Prince. Hello, everybody. I actually didn't want to do film in the beginning. I went into gaming and I wanted to like sculpt and make the, and the design of the characters. So that's what I went to college for. But alongside that, we had to do film as well. And during the time doing that, I actually fell in love with editing. And for my final year in college, I went down that path and, in, and then took film practice in uni. And I thought I was not going to get anything after that. But um, luckily, um, during work experience, I managed to get a job doing mm -hmm. corporal videos as well, as well as Scott. <laughs> it was great. I learned a lot. But then after that, I wasn't sure which direction or how I should go, what should I, what should I do, because it's different from applying for other jobs. And eventually I got into a training scheme for the BBC. And that's how I've got my first credit. But then COVID hit and I thought I wasn't going to find work for years because we didn't know how long COVID would last. But luckily I did find something else and that TV show would be called The Fear Index, which we shall roll right now. Fear is driving the world like never before. Humans act in very predictable ways when they're frightened. And we've only gone and found a way to make money out of it. Alex makes a lot of money for a lot of people. I love him. We built an algorithm ideally suited to trading in the financial markets. Traders call it the fear index. It is always the unknown that is most frightening. Jeez. He's not in his right mind. He can't be trusted. Something very strange is happening. I am being framed. My work computer's been compromised. I need you to let me help you. Do you have any idea who might want to destroy Dr. Hoffman? It's, uh, it's great that we've all got such a range of experience. I feel like that's going to be quite handy in this chat. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing I sort of want to talk about is from your guys' experience and opinions, um, what do you see the role of the assistant editor being? Um, so for me, it is very much a case of sort of the the person who quietly runs everything so the not the grown-ups but the grown-ups can um, do all the hard decision making so all the all the sort of backroom quiet engine room stuff is happening in the assistant editor's room how do you guys it can be so many things i think it's really just to facilitate the edit and the editor um you know doing the, doing their you know getting their job done i mean the biggest thing uh is always getting the getting the rushes getting the dailies uh uh to them and and making sure that that those dailies are going to uh you know have all the metadata to translate into a finished product it can be you know uh doing sound effects passes and uh uh, you know, temp visual effects, um, 
you know, uh, you know, sometimes cutting the before and afters because a lot of television editors hate doing those. So, uh, you know, it can be so many different things. Do you have a um, favorite part of the assistant editing role? Or because for me, it was always VFX. I, I love just tinkering around on Avid and just putting something together that didn't exist before. V visual effects. Um, yeah, for me, for me, I, I love, uh, I'm currently uh, sort of dabbling in, in assembly editing and I, I love, I love that. I love it. I love it whenever I get a chance to actually cut something. I, that's, that's my favorite part of the process. How about, how about, how about you, uh, Prince? The difference I would say is um, like, so I think essentially you're there to help support the first and the editors and Without you, it kind of just it can fall apart <laughs> because everybody's working. It's like a gear. When a gear goes, everything goes. It's all smooth and nice. But then something goes wrong. That machine is broken. So I think everybody's role is important. But without you, it, there's more stress on the first. And then it's just on the first, then the editor doesn't get what they need. And then it's just a whole mess. Hmm. Yeah. Um, my favorite, I would say I do like the um, VFX as well. I mean, it can be stressful at times <laughs> if it doesn't go the way you want and then you have to keep repeating it. But it's that's also kind of the fun to it because you have to try and solve that problem. And then once you solved it, it's very, it's like very like satisfying. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I, yeah. I say that's the best part of being an assistant is when you get those like hard logic puzzles that you just after days manage to crack. And then mm, suddenly yeah, exactly. you're like, oh, okay, I can do my job. This is great. <laughs> what have you learned, Alice, about everything so far? I think it depends um, mainly on what kind of production you're in and also on budget because I mean there are some editors that work totally alone and or other productions that might have you know an editor and then a, a second assistant editor and a first assistant editor so I think like Prince said the role of the assistant editor is really important because you need to facilitate uh, the work that the main editor is doing and so it's it's kind of like Mm, making sure that everything is falling in the right pieces <laughs> that makes sense in the right in the right you know little little things and that will make out essentially the, the final project and I think there's also a really um well maybe not so clear difference between the first system editor and the second one I think the second the second one doesn't have as much insight as the first one would have, um, and you can tell me a bit more about it if I'm if I'm wrong or or, or or if I'm right. So I think I might have a slightly skewed experience of it because I both when I was a second and when I have been a first with a second. I have very much been a fan of the sort of collaborative, everyone sort of jumps in with whatever comes up at the time. Obviously, when I've been a first, I've not put so much on my second <laughs> that they're doing my job for me. But I think what's great about the first and second assistant um, dynamic is that the first assistant, as well as obviously getting the work done, can really mentor the second assistant in a way that sets them up to run their own cutting room and that's that is a part of um being a first that I personally really enjoy and being able to sort of um share the things that I've learned see what they come with and like the the information they've already had and sometimes by speaking to your second they find a workflow that's just so much more efficient that you've been doing wrong for years and then suddenly your entire workflow has changed and it's so much better so for me personally it's it's always been a very collaborative uh relationship between first and second 
Scott, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, some se seconds are, they really should be first. Like they're so good that it's it's just, it's it's surprising. And then there, there are some seconds who are, you know, starting off. Uh, but then I, I think that personally, I think that television and independent film uh, give the most opportunity for advancement of an assistant. I find that in uh, major studio uh, productions, you can, you're, um, the roles are a lot more rigidly defined and the, the seconds, you know, have a much harder time going up the ranks, uh, even though they might be doing more complicated stuff um it's it's a lot it's quite limiting and that's why even though I started off a major uh, studio well I didn't start off but that's where I was really trained was a major studio uh, a major studio film it, it uh, I saw that that it was going to be really tough to advance and so I was just kind of itching to get into television independent film specifically UK driven as, a, as opposed to US driven. What was it about the UK um, TV that, that drew you to it? Um, well, it's just, it's just, it's made, the, like the people that you're working for are here. And if you're here, you can form a, a relationship that goes beyond one film or, or uh, or one series. Um, it's just, and, and also, yeah, it's just, um, it's really just about working in your sort of home country. Um, it just sort of allows you to build a career and over time, um, as opposed to just being sort of a, a hired hand. And also, um, UK productions tend to be you know, small, sm smaller scale, and there's there's just more room to sort of um, advance, in my opinion. Hmm. I think you bring up two really interesting things that I'd love to touch on. I think one is the location of, obviously, the UK is quite small, especially compared to the US, obviously. Um, and so there is a lot of... Um, you know that there's a chance if you walk down the street in Soho, you're gonna know someone just through uh, having worked in the same post house or yeah. what have you. And then the other thing I'd love to talk about is the progression of um, the career path because I think that's that's really interesting in the sense that there there are a lot of people who have come into assistant editing as runners. There are a lot of people who have come from different types of editing that have sort of taken the step back to learn the ropes in TV. Um, I personally was incredibly lucky in that whilst I was at university, an editor showed me great kindness and gave me a, a chance to cover his uh, assistant while he was on holiday. And I, I was lucky enough to sort of leapfrog over the running stage, but I, I know that generally speaking, running in a post house is the clear way into the industry in the UK. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that's the case yeah. in Canada. People do start off doing runner like jobs in editorial, um, but it's just it's much more like those sort of those sort of lucky leaps are harder to come by because of, because there's seniority levels and oh. all sorts of things. I mean, um it wasn't something that I even really delved into when I was in Canada. It was almost like a, a sort of, it was, it was almost like a barrier that just kept my interest of getting involved with it very low. Mm -hmm. uh, and every time I sort of investigated it, I thought, no, I don't, I just can't, I, I just, I just can't uh, sort of navigate those, you know, the, those sort of that political structure. Uh, and then when I came to the UK, I wasn't even planning really on getting into editorial. Um, I just sort of mainly came to the UK uh, for sort of, you know, sort of because it's a, it has a filmmaking tradition. I, I knew I, I wanted to 
work in the industry here in some capacity, but you had the freedom to kind of get in on your sort of skills yeah. and, and, and your sort of any connections that you were lucky enough to make, you could capitalize on. Prince, what's, what's your experience been of, um, and obviously at a different stage of career, but what's your experience been of that sort of slightly more open industry? That... Well, I also skipped the um, runner stage. Nice. I went. Wow, so we to... all skipped the runner stage. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we are lucky... very lucky in that, I would say. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough to get a um, the training scheme, as I mentioned before. Oh, yes. And then from the connections I made there, I managed to get more and more work. And then, you know, new jobs, you meet new people, you build up your connections. You just have to make sure that you stay in touch with them. <laughs> um, and you also check up on them, how they're doing, so they don't forget about you. And, you know, send your CV to them now and again when it's updated to maybe say, hey, I'm still here. Um, otherwise, yeah, it could just kind of, the relationship could fizzle out and then they'll forget about you and they won't offer you work if they get something and they don't, they don't need it. I think an, an interesting uh, point that's just come up in my mind is also the when you say staying in touch with people and sort of you know checking in how they are and, and what have you I think finding work as an assistant at least in my experience has been you know 50% being available at the right time and knowing what I'm doing and the other 50% being hopefully pleasant enough that people want to work with me again yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and the, that's something that's so so valuable as a skill if you can get on with your other assistants your editors even your producers and directors I think it's it's much more likely that you're going to stick in the mind of someone if you can you know even if you're just bringing someone a cup of tea when they haven't necessarily asked for it or whatever it just it makes a huge difference to sort of team morale and stuff like mm. that <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. What is the situation like in Italy, like in the Italian film industry? Mm, what I understand, um, they're not as like as like rigid and organized um, as they would be like in the US or like even in the UK, really. Even like if you want to get a runner job, I, I don't I don't think you could. I think if you wanted to be recognized as an editor in Italy, you would probably need to start as a video editor doing, you know, show films as well, uh, sure. Um, but it's not as uh, inclusive as the UK for sure. And I've had the experience recently because um, I've been doing some shifts um, as, for a, as a runner um, for several um, post houses here in London and and once you know my the runner that I was working with he got called um from he got a call from a from his editor um that was working upstairs and was like you know I just you know I have like 30 minutes and I don't know what to do do you want to come upstairs and I can show you what I'm doing and we can work on this this stuff and this, this project and whatever and it was you know, really, just really nice to see because, uh, you know, like you said, you can really just get a runner job and and work your way up there. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think in Italy is that really, is, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. The runner route is like the one that you hear all the time. Mm. Like I hear that all the time. Like so many editors, they all started off as runners. Um yeah, it's it. It kind of makes me a little sad that I never <laughs> did did it. In, I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that sort of camaraderie thing going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do always find myself if I have a free afternoon and I'm working in a post house. If there's a runner who's particularly nice to me or gives me extra biscuits with my tea, I'll I'll see if they want it. And they might not always have time, or they might not always be. Uh, you know, interested in specifically what I'm doing, but I always try and 
uh, give that opportunity because as you say that's that's how people build up those skills yeah. definitely yeah. Um, so we've had a question to give a general overview of the roles <laughs> of the first and second assistant and an edit trainee in terms of specifically tasks that they perform mm. um I would say that on a on a job that has a first and assistant and a first and a second assistant, um, I think generally speaking, the first assistant would be the one in charge of the big picture things like um, uh, turnovers and keeping track of all of the various uh, paperwork and things going out, things coming in. Um, liaison with the producer and the director, whoever needs anything from editorial, yeah. essentially. And generally speaking, is the point person for who speaks to the editor as well. Obviously, not saying that they both don't talk to the editor, but um, generally speaking, they're they're the point <laughs> of contact in the assisting room for anything that anyone needs. Um, the second assistant, and again. I could have this wrong because my experience is a little skewed, but generally I think they are more in charge of the sort of day-to-day -day, um, rushes coming in, um, ingesting media, uh, organising bins, organising the, the paperwork that comes from set and stuff like that. Yeah, and it, and it's such an important role too. I mean, like they really have to. I mean, that's to me rushes is like the most important. It's like you know, really high on the list of um, oh, yeah important things. And so you really want a good second there. Um, and then um, yeah, the only uh, the only other thing I'm not sure if you touched on it, Helena, was uh, the the trainee uh and yes. trainee um that is like a very rare position in my experience and it tends to you tend to only get it on really big budget things um and from my experience it mainly they're almost like an office pa is that is that what your guys understanding it is Personally, I've never worked with an edit trainee, but that is my general understanding that they're sort of um, there to facilitate the sort of uh, more sort of pastoral side of it. So, as you say, sort of like a um, just a, a PA who's who's around, I believe. Yeah, it used to be um, printing off paperwork. That's not so much the case anymore with the digital uh, workflow uh, workflows. Um, a lot of the times, like it was like uh, on on one major studio film, it was like writing down what scenes were on what shoot days on a big uh, blackboard that we kept in the hallway, like doing lunch mm -hmm. runs and. Mm -hmm. That, you know, anything that needed to be picked up from town. Um, so it was kind of like a like a like an editorial PA almost like a lot of people. It sounds as though they're actually going to be working on an avid. But from my experience, the edit trainee is not really that it's like almost like a editorial PA. It's I think it's um, again, I've, I've had similar experience uh, in that. Um, I, the editorial trainees that I've been aware of, not directly worked with, but sort of around the post house, um, have sort of been in that role for, from a personal standpoint, on their point of view, um, have been in that role in order to sort of be around it and sort of absorb it. And, um, you know, if if anyone has free time to sort of ask the questions and sort of get the experience that way rather than as you say sitting down at an avid and actually day to day being able to do, do things um with that I think is my understanding of it um but as I agree with you I've, I've very rarely seen that in uh the UK um unless it is on a, a particularly big show that just has so many moving parts that need that extra bit of help i will also say that as a second assistant i have um 
also done a lot of those sort of uh, editorial training duties with the lunch runs and things like that. <laughs> um, it's very much a Ron Pitchin sort of sort of vibe with that. From my experience when I was a trainee, I essentially did the same, like similar things to the second. I did do, yeah, lunch runs, as you said, uh, in charge of paid cash mm-hmm. and just um, making sure everything, like all the paperwork is in the right spot. But I also um, did rushes okay. and sound effects, um, as well as some of the effects, something. Oh wow! When you so you, that was your title was uh, yeah a, a trainee and they were al- allowing you to do that yeah they were wow, yeah that's amazing <laughs> but um it was I never used Avid until I started that right. um because I was taught on Premiere Pro <laughs> until I got to that job and I was surprised that Avid was actually the preferred software yeah so on that. They actually taught me how to use Avid, which was actually really nice. <laughs> yeah. The editor, unfortunately, didn't have time, but the the first um, was really nice, and she helped me, and then she gave me work, and I actually cut some scenes <laughs> as well while I was there. Um, it might it might have been because we did have four assistants. <laughs> that that included myself. Yeah, we had four. And we were all like in a little room together. <laughs> so I guess while they were doing like most of the work, I got to actually play around with Avid and they gave me stuff to do. But as you said, Helena, that it, it does depend on the budget and how many people they need and if they could afford to actually have a training on. Yeah. So that must have been a big budget production, right? That was that um, any- I think it it was. It was it was for the BBC. Oh. Uh, it was pretty big actually, yeah. Hmm. And it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Especially as like my first big um T V show. <laughs> cool. Um, so going back to something you said earlier, Scott, about the sort of location of being on hand in London with all the film and TV industry going all around it. Um I think particularly since the pandemic, the opportunity to work sort of everywhere in the world is slightly more available to a lot of people. Um, I think that in terms of assistant editing can be a little tricky because uh, such a large part of the role of the assistant editor is to support the editor. And if the editor requires an assistant on the ground, whether by personal preference or workflow or what have you, then someone who's based remotely wouldn't be a viable option for that production. Um, Myself, I, at the, sort of in the middle of the pandemic, I realised that I was uh, paying London rent and not going into London. So uh, me and my partner moved back to Yorkshire, which is where I'm from originally. And there was a a real and genuine fear of, um, am I ever going to find work again? Because I've moved away from London and that's so much of where the UK industry is. Um, I think I've been incredibly lucky to be able to get solid work since moving up. And I think in no small part I've been able to get that work because of, as Prince was saying, because I sort of check in with people I've worked with before uh, when I've been working down in London, sort of built those relationships. And I sort of have a vague idea of which editors would be open to working remotely. And um, funnily enough, I was working remotely before the pandemic even hit because the uh, the last film we did in 2019, the editor was up in Yorkshire and I was down in London. So I got quite comfortable with that workflow. And because of that, I feel like working remotely has become a more viable option for me. How do you guys feel with that? Are you all working in person? Are you remote? Friends? <laughs> you don't have to raise um... I know, I know, but <laughs> it's actually you. Find, um, I'm actually planning to move out of London soon. 
Right. Um, I don't have no equipment or anything at all. Um, the current job I'm on, I'm actually working remotely, but the company actually brought kit for me. Mm-hmm. But when I move out, um, obviously I'm gonna supply with my own kit. Mm-hmm. And I was actually worried that because I'm remote and not in London, I will um it will be harder for me to find work. Mm-hmm. But I think now I'm, you know because of the pandemic, a lot of people are more working remotely. Um, which, you know, it's good if you're moving out of London. <laughs> Definitely. But on it is easier to work with editors and other firsts and seconds in person. I feel like that helps me more grow yeah. and gain more knowledge. Whereas working remotely, it, you're not it's not as personal and you don't really feel that connected to the editor and to the other assistants it's just working with them in your, the same room they could help you more you could ask questions mm-hmm. um you could help them you know they're just down the hall you could be like you want some tea yeah. something just <laughs> like that i think it makes it easier to be there with them but work on remote is easier for other people and especially if you want to be a second who's not in London that is a very good option to have that working remotely and I think um something Mm -hmm. the pandemic really sort of highlighted to a lot of people is the work-life balance that working remotely allows especially I know a lot of people sort of started families during the pandemic in and then there was the worry of you know am I going to be able to stay in this industry which as we all know is very long hours and can be very very stressful um but being able to do that remotely just allows things like you know school drop-off to happen and and things like that which is I think a great step forward personally Mm. I mean I I love I I love the that idea that remote working uh could be more widespread like I would love to have a dog (laughs) but I can't (laughs) I can't have one now (laughs) um so uh yeah I mean I have I have worked remotely but I've found that if the relationship is not has was not personally uh was not built for me in person it's not as good of a relationship like, like I feel like when I've worked for an editor remotely and they've never met me in person, there's not there's not that same level of trust or respect or um, and I've found that a bit challenging. Um, but I have worked for editors remotely who I've worked with in person and and it's been great. Um, but it, it would be it would be. Um, it would be nice if it was more sort of uh, widespread. I mean, because it gives a lot of flexibility in life because it is, I mean, uh, the hours that we work are, you know, very, very long. Uh, and, and uh, it, it, you know, sometimes it would be nice to, you know, to get away and be able to do the things that you, that you need in order to, you know, live, you know, personal upkeep <laughs> have you know I've only worked um remotely <laughs> like I'm I'm assisting in like well assisting it's just like editing some interviews and yeah I mean I just hate like emailing them about certain things that I'm not sure about while instead you know I would be so much more comfortable just like turning around and be like do you like this <laughs> Or do do you think that's good? Or you know what what else should I do next? Um, so yeah, but 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 that's just what what I what I wanted to add <laughs> to it. Helena, were you um, your sort of rem- remote working? Is it is it mostly for people that you've worked with before in person, or is it or um, new experiences where you've been working with com- completely new people that you've never met in person? Yeah. Um... 
that's a good question. I think I just casting back over the last few years. Um, I I think it's been a mix of the of the two. Um, but I will say that I think generally, and I think this goes back to um, how I was able to find the work in the first place. Um, generally speaking, the first editor on a project will be one that I've already met um, because they're obviously more likely to think, ah, oh, Helena, she knows what she's doing, um, than someone who's who's never met me and has no idea what I can do. Um, I have met editors Oh, I have worked with editors over the last couple of years who I've never met and still have never met, um, who I feel I've built up a good relationship and rapport with. But what I will absolutely agree is that it's so much easier when on the ground and in the same building to, if anything, just to um, sort of sense when's a good time to ask a question and when's not. You know, you don't know if you're working remotely, if your editor's up against, I mean, I'd like to think you know if they're up against deadline, but like, you know, you don't know if their avid has just crashed three times in a row and, you know, they're ready to yeah. pull their out or if they're just really calm and relaxed and a great time to chat. Um, that That is something that's definitely harder. What I will say um, about that sort of assistant editor relationship is that, in my experience, the the jobs that I have gotten the most out of and the jobs that I have felt the proudest of are the ones in which myself and my editor have had a fairly, not a collaborative relationship necessarily, but a fairly free-flowing back and forth about editorial in general. And not, not even just that, just life, um, you know, like editors have so much knowledge and experience that they can pass down to assistants and it's it's really great when they are willing and able to do that um obviously not all the time they're very busy and it's a very stressful job to be an editor but um that that is something that I think some of my best experiences have been when my editor has been more like a mentor than a head of department sort of thing um just wanted to get that out there <laughs> um so one other thing I'd love to touch on is sort of progression from assistant editing because we've talked about how we get there but um progression after that so I don't know what you guys feel about sort of what you want to be when you grow up sort of thing but myself personally um my experience is that a lot of my colleagues and peers are assistant editing but desperate to be assembling and editing and I always sort of thought there was something a little bit wrong with me because I actually really enjoy the assisting and I'm not sure I, I will happily do the editing but it's not I don't think it's a passion for me in the same way that assisting is even though you know assistants have to work longer sometimes or you know they have to do the the nitty-gritty bits that no one really likes doing before I, before i sort of mention what my what my interests were um like do you think if you hadn't sort of gotten involved in the sort of visual effects side of things that that maybe you might have um not been as interested in assisting yeah it's a great question um i actually had no intention of being a vfx editor to the point where when i was offered the role i said are you sure really um quite a few times actually i'm surprised they hired me but um no i i been thinking for a few years because I, I spoke to my um my friends who are sort of at the same stage and who were all you know making those leaps to assembling and editing and they were all saying you know oh, I wish I could cut more and, and all of this and I was sort of thinking well I don't I don't really care if I cut more if someone gives me something to cut it's more of a hassle than anything for me 
Um, so I, I had definitely been thinking for a good couple of years before the pandemic even hit, I wonder if I will be a career assistant and just do that because I know it, I enjoy it. I like to think I'm good at it. And, you know, it's, it's a job that will continue to be needed. Um, whether I progress out of it or not. Um, the way that I fell into VFX editing, as I mentioned, was very much a, they were looking for someone to fill the role. They have my CV. They thought I could do it. And I sort of said, okay. <laughs> um, and now, now that I'm remote, a, a thought that I have is that VFX editing allows a little bit more flexibility to be remote because you don't need to be on the ground with anyone. You can sort of, you know, if I'm just sort of working away on a database, I don't need to be in the same room as an editor who needs track laying done or what have you. Um, so I think part of what made me say yes to that opportunity was potentially this might be more viable for working away from London than assisting. Um, I've only done two jobs of it and it's it's been on the same production so who knows if I'd ever get it again on something else but I mean so far I just I really enjoy it for me it's all the best parts of assisting sort of honed down into the effects of the thing so yeah that that is how I got there. Huge demand for it there's yeah. a huge demand for it so I think like if, if that's your interest I think it's great that because people are always looking for VFX editors so hopefully yeah. so Definitely. long as they let me be remote it was I have to say one of the hardest things I've ever had to do was turning down Star Wars and saying no actually I want to move away from London but it had to be done and it was yeah. the right decision in the end yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I actually, uh, yeah, know some people have worked in uh, uh, continental Europe uh, remotely uh, for London productions. So as as VFX editors, so yeah, it totally happens. I do. I would like to progress progress as an editor. Um, I want to take one more job as a second after this one and then I will step up to be a first there's not really a kind of signal to know when you should make that jump it's more take the leap if it doesn't work out then you can take a step back gain more knowledge um do more things that you think is your weakness <laughs> and then once you feel like you're ready to make that jump again keep going and eventually it will work out so that's that's my mindset <laughs> at the moment yeah um for me instead well I'm just kind of yes I will try to get a job <laughs> as an assistant editor for sure because I because I want to try it I want to I know what it's like um uh but I'm also interested in the camera department so I'm just trying to like to juggle both at yeah. the same time and well, also, like Scott said, he, it's not a very glamorous life. You know, you work long hours. Uh, you mostly stay in the same room <laughs> looking at footage all the time. Sometimes, you know, even while editing like short films uh, like I did at uni, it's just like it's really sometimes stressful because you keep looking at the same footage. And sometimes you just get bored of it. <laughs> You're just like, oh God, I need to, you know, stop my laptop and just like take a walk and get back and watch everything again with like a pair of like fresh eyes. Cause it's like, it can, it can be, you know, a lot. <laughs> um, so it's not, certainly not a career for, for every, for everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Alice. And I just I just wanted to also bring Scott in. And did you want to touch on your um, desires for your career progression? I, I've had a long path. Uh, and I'll just say that from the age of four, I wanted to be a writer director. 
I've never lost that. Uh, but the stars didn't align for it. But my favorite part of making a film is editing it. That's always been my favorite part. Um, it's the most, to me, it's kind of, it's, it's just, it's like writing. It's like, so it's, it, it's like writing with pictures. So I would love to be an editor. Um, uh, you know, with, you know, maybe getting to direct one day, maybe, but if I was an editor, if I could be an editor, if I could be a working editor, that would be enough. And, you know, because it, because it is like writing a movie, you know, assisting, um, you know, editors that I respect is, you know, very incredibly rewarding. And um, this clip uh, that I believe you're going to play now is from a movie called Living. It was a very artistically rewarding experience. And um, it's a remake of one of my dad's three favorite films. Uh, so it was so great to, you know, be able to tell him that I was working on this uh, great, uh, you know, creative team. And it has, uh, you know, been nominated for two Academy Awards, um, which I'm incredibly proud of. So, uh, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. From when I was a child, what I wanted was to be a gentleman. And life just crept up on me, one day preceding the next. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mr. Williams. Not happy, not unhappy. It was small wonder I didn't notice. Mr. Williams, doctor will see you now. The results have come back. It's never easy, this. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, if we had more time, I'd love to hear more of your comments on that. But I would love um, to give Helena and Prince the opportunity just to show their second clip as well, just to give the audience uh, more of a sense of the breadth of the um, projects that you've been working on and talking about. Um, so Prince, would you like to show um, a little bit of your second clip? You look for good, even in the worst of humanity, don't you? And sometimes I find it, too. Chief Inspector Gamage, why don't you walk us through what you have so far? One minute she's sitting in the chair, next she's dead. And no one saw anything suspicious. Not a thing. She wasn't the easiest person to get along with. She was a little critical. She seemed a little cold. I think they all hated her, every single one of them. Thank you. Again, that just reflects some of the breadth of experience that um, you have had as a, been having as a, a second assistant. Um, and Helena, you have a second clip as well, don't you? Yes, yeah, this is um, the series that I'm working on as a VFX editor. In light of the events of the last 12 months, perhaps I have more to reflect on than most. The royal family is in genuine crisis. Have royal scandals damaged the country's reputation? The House of Windsor should be binding the nation together, setting an example of idealized family life. It's a situation that cannot help but affect the stability of the country. That's great to see. And I know you've touched on this, but did you want to talk just a little bit about um, how you can combine two roles? Yeah. Um, so what I have found quite pleasantly to my surprise is that a lot of my experience as an assistant editor has sort of set me up um in order to be able to do the vfx editor role um a lot of what i would think the similarities would be uh, the organizational side of it 
um, I'd say that one of the most important things about being an assistant is just keeping track of everything that is going on at any time. Um, for me, it's thousands of post-it notes, but whatever, whatever works for you. Um, and it's it's just about sort of being able to spin those plates constantly without without letting any of them drop because especially as an assistant editor as Scott was saying earlier it's it's very much uh, if something goes wrong you got to fix it as quickly as possible so the rest of the machine doesn't get clogged you know um and the, and then of course the the actual the temporary VFX and things like that the VFX list that I made as an assistant was sort of a precursor to the databases that I'm making now um so it, it really is a viable option as a progression from an assistant if you're not wanting to go the editor route necessarily um because it it's a sort of slightly more advanced assisting role um but it has the creativity and the the sort of problem solving in there as well which i personally really enjoy uh, I would love to just turn to a couple of the questions in the Q&A yeah. um, before um, we draw this talk to a, a conclusion. Do you each have three hot, one, two, three hot tips to leave people with um, at the end of this discussion? Um, and I'm also just looking at, um, you know, should the out working hours be so long? I mean, maybe that's one of your hot tips about keeping an eye on working hours. So that might be one of your hot tips. But so I'm going to throw it out to each of the speakers. What are your final hot tips for being a good assistant? So uh, in regards to the hours being so long, um, personally, I, I found it very, very difficult at the start of um, my career to sort of set the boundaries almost of sort of explaining that actually I, I need to get home and like there were a few times when you know I'd be close to getting the last train home and I'd have to sort of say I gotta I gotta go um that I feel has gone easier with experience I think it's a case of now I'm able to sort of determine which job is actually urgent and needs to happen that night and which job could maybe wait until tomorrow and maybe it's not as urgent as it first seems. Um, that is, that sort of confidence in that determination is something that in my experience only came with experience. Um, I will also say that most nice editors, and I've been incredibly lucky to work with some excellent ones, are just as aware of a work-life balance as you are and therefore will sort of say look I'm gonna work late you don't have to see you tomorrow um those are the ones that you want to stay in touch with definitely um my my top three tips I would say are be friendly and sort of personable um be organized I cannot overstate how useful that is as an assistant and I would also say to ask questions, because I think it's very, very easy in such a high stress department to sort of internalize and sort of not want to disturb anyone. But most people that you work with will be absolutely lovely and will be willing to give you that advice. And that is how you progress, in my opinion. So ask those questions. Prince, what are your final three hot tips? Don't be afraid to say no. <laughs> um, but when, yeah, as when I said, if it's coming towards the end of the day, you just make that train. Um, sometimes you can you could say, you know, don't be afraid to say no. This like we could do this could be done tomorrow. Otherwise, you know, I'm not gonna make my train. Then you're gonna have to get cab back, and there's. Just, a lot because what editors some editors do is they will take advantage of you especially if you're inexperienced so sometimes you do have to set those boundaries and say all right i have to be out of here by some, some time so i could at least get home you know if you have kids or anything or anything that you need to attend to with your responsibilities um 
Another tip, don't be discouraged if you're not getting any work. If you know, I know I find it stressful when I was emailing, I was posting on the Facebook groups, and every time nothing happened, or they will get back to you, they never do. Or if they say, sorry, we went with somebody else, it could be like really depressing. And you just want to, you know, be like, you know what, forget it. <laughs> We're going to take a different path now. Um, so just keep at it. There is a lot of assistant jobs out there, a lot more nowadays, because a lot of people actually want to step up to editor. So there's a lot more assistant roles, ups for grabs. Thank you, Prince. That's a really that's a really good final hot tip. And Alice, do you have a, a hot tip for those beginning to come into the industry? Yeah, um, like we like we mentioned already, um, do search for uh, runner positions if you want to get into the editorial department. Um, and like everyone said already, um, make sure to track the, your time and make sure to know when to say no and take time for yourself. Because even now that I'm starting out as a freelancer, you know, I, sometimes I feel like I'm not working enough and, and I say yes to a lot of things. And at the end of it, you know, I might not have enough time for myself. And, you know, that's that it's not a, the right balance that you want to you want to have in your in your life. So, yeah, make sure to, to balance your work life. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. And uh, Scott, if you'd like to give your final one, two, or couple of hot tips. I totally agree with what everyone else has said about protecting yourself, but I don't know anyone who works in this business who's lazy. So you have to develop a very strong work ethic or you won't survive because it's so competitive. Yeah. Um, secondly, I wouldn't go into this industry if you can do anything else. You have to, you like, you have to want, like you have to, not you have to want, you have to make movies or you, you just should not do this. Third, learn Avid. There's no way around it. If you want to work in uh, scripted, you know, drama, um that's just you, you really do need to know avid inside out or uh, very well um you need to have a very strong work uh, knowledge of, of it um it has just been so thrilling to have you um speak with us and share your knowledge and insights it's been absolutely fascinating um that leaves me to thank um helena and alice and prince and scott for sharing your knowledge experience and giving your time um, to our audience thank you all ever so much for um this wonderful cross-border conversation thanks elizabeth thank you thank you everyone